Councillor Tony Smith's apologies. Unfortunately, he had family bereavements over the weekend, so um, he's not able to, to, to be here today. Uh, so, item one is uh, members' code of conduct. Can I ask if any members of the cabinet wish to declare any interests? Can you please say that? No? Okay. Um, item two is the minutes of the last meeting. Can we agree that item's a true record? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm, um, I'll let's just deal with item three because there are no uh, key executive decisions uh, that we need to uh, note this, this uh, meeting. Um, I'm going to just suggest a slight alteration of the order of business. Um, uh, I'm going to suggest that we take item number five, number of councillors scrutiny review first, because I know that Councillor Steve Fouts is, is, is uh, kindly agreed to come on to uh, present this report as a member of the review panel. Unfortunately, Councillor Phil Brightmore, the chair, has got a work commitment, so he's not able to be here. So we're very grateful, Steve, for you to, uh, to, to be here today. So can I suggest that we ask Steve to come forward and, uh, and just present the, the main findings of this report, and then we'll um, open up to any, any questions. Okay. Okay, Steve, welcome. Yeah, and again, apologies to Councillor Brightmore, and there lies the tale, because I've had to uh, make my way from work here. Uh, and it does show the um, work of councillors have trying to keep a, a work life and a, uh, and a council to roll together. So it's, it's quite funny that, that we start off with that apology. Uh, firstly, can I just say that the um, notice of motion that generated um, the, the, the review um, was discussed and then it went to the coordinating committee, which then sort of rounded it off and that's the recommendation of work on but then quite early on in our sort of discussions, the, it was found that the notice of motion was effectively trying to compare apples with pears and to compare them with a look of policy that was, that was quite different. But um, all members on the uh, committee or, or the sub panel have dealt with it, uh, and all parties were represented, other than the three parties don't have a representative on, on, on the committee, uh, quickly came to the point of view that you know, we were dealing with a completely different sort of uh, entity in Wales, so we concentrate on more. We all went in with, period, with open minds thinking um, we would investigate this, but it came quite clear that the pivotal issue is about when you could persuade the Boundary Commission A to look at your case and B to build a case that would convince them that you could reduce the number of councils. It became quite apparent in comparison to our other councils who are of similar ill. Uh, we compared almost favourably. In, in fairly, virtually every case, uh, it was favourable to the will actually looking quite a good lead sort of uh, organisation and a good representative of democracy. And I think we have to accept if we believe in representative of democracy, then there will be a price of some sort associated with that. So to fulfil that role effectively, um, the, the main findings were that we were probably in about the right position to do that. And the mechanism of referring to the Boundary Commission would A, not be very difficult. We haven't tried to prove the case effectively through the scrutiny panel. It would be almost impossible for the officers to create a case to say that there wasn't the necessary need to go to the Boundary Commission. The, the likely time scale from, from the reports we had would be in that would take over two years possibly to actually go through that time scale if indeed we were accepted. So as a mechanism for saving money, and we all realise that that is something we should all look to do, it probably wasn't an effective way of saving money either, uh, in terms of the time scale and the outcome. And there may have been lots of other repercussions which are, are in the report and hinted at the report. So I won't, won't bore committee, you, you've all read it, I guess it's probably the most read scrutiny panel uh, 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 report that's certainly, uh, I guess, every single council read it. Just to add that all the members of the, of the committee of all parties signed up to this recommendation. And furthermore, we uh, took that back to the permanent committee and again it was unanimously supported by all parties on that, um, that committee. Um, and just to say, Patrick, who, who led the discussions uh, as, as security officer, done an excellent job, we were very well supported. Praise again to the chair who coordinated the meetings. We had a lot of meetings in a very short space of time, so the time
design commitment was there. And I think by and large we, we, we came to this decision and in, in a more rounded view, we probably felt if we did go down this path, we would probably end up with councillors who would be full time. And that by its own nature means that you probably end up with a non-representative democracy because it's only people who can afford the time. So you may yeah, end up with a completely different shade of council. At the moment, I believe, we allow access to people from all walks of life. And that's what makes our democracy great in a way that we have all factions of our community represented. And we are unrepresented by women still. We are unrepresented by uh, ethnic uh, communities uh, on the council and certainly people with disabilities as well. So if you went down any, another path, you may well make that, this, that, that attraction of councillors from all walks of life even more difficult. Although it's not excluding them, specifically highlighting the reforms. So at the end of the day, Chair, you can see the evidence for yourself in comparison. Will councillors seem to be reasonable value for money? But I would expect in the, the current times that we are that you will look at the democratic processes in terms of saving. But in terms of, of a blunt instrument of numbers of councillors, this might not be the way of achieving those savings. But I wish uh, cabinets every you know, uh, good luck in the future, look at the savings. And I certainly think councillors as a body expect to be part of that saving. And in fact, have been if you look over the number, number of years in terms of not having any increased expenses uh, and, uh, and the amount that is, is, is sort of compared to other councils. We represent fairly good value. And that, that's it. as much as I can say, Chair, in representing uh, on behalf of all the parties involved in, in the discussion. Okay, uh, thanks for that, um, <coughs> Steve. Uh, I'll take, take some questions. Uh, Jan? Um, thanks, Phil. It's more for me. Uh, thanks for this. I know it's been more than a way on the horizon for a few years, and I'm glad that um, cross party, uh, there's been pro cross party acknowledgement that we're all councils of good value. I always thought it anyway, and we have to, you know, fight the narrative that, that you know that we're not and we can get rid of the third straight away. And I'm glad that this is fact factually based, it's empirically and evidence based. And let's hope that we do encourage more people to come on board, as she says, especially women with disabilities because we have got we do need a good range of counsellors. So so it's nice that you've produced a piece of work and spent so much time on, on, on reinforcing what I've always believed anyway. And let's hope people start to give us a break and then um, doubt it.
the state that we shouldn't use every opportunity to drive more efficiencies in the house. But I mean, I, I, I think um, the, the review panel's done good work of, of, of really sort of saying that a blunt instrument of just reducing from 66 to 44 is actually not a particularly um, smart way of looking at this issue. Um, I think for, for all the reasons you've, you've mentioned, um, <coughs> Um, I think the, the other thing that you highlight in the report, which I think is, is interesting, actually, the role of the council is changing massively, um, both over the last few years, I think will change even more over the next few years. And arguably, you could, you could make it, I think one could make an argument that councillors will have an even uh, more important role to play as funding is withdrawn and we have to um, work with our constituents and other organisations in the public sector sector to identify ways in which that funding uh, reduction from government can be bridged and can be, can be filled. So, you know, you know, there is a case, I think, for saying that the councils will pay probably a more important role going forward than they have even, even in the past. So, um, I think uh, I'd like to say that I, I think um, people are asking the cabinet to endorse the, the, the recommendation um, of the which is that um, uh, we, we do not feel there is a basis for requesting the Boundary Commission to conduct a review of our electoral arrangements at this time. Um, and the recommendation is that we endorse that, that conclusion and that we, um, refer, the, that we refer this report to council, full council, for, for endorsement of the, the new panel's findings. And I think the fact that it has got all party endorsement, I think, makes it uh, I think it is appropriate that we uh, refer it to council for that reason. So, can I can I propose that as a as a recommendation? Is that great? Okay. And just can I just thank you, Steve, for coming in to present the findings of the review panel. And obviously, we'll record our thanks to the whole review panel for the thank you. Thanks for getting me along. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
um, the report is asking for authority to uh, work with the Liverpool Vision over the next six months to develop this, uh, this narrative about the opportunities in the world, and secondly, to create advertisers' temporary posts. And we are also, as part of the recommendations, asking Cabinet to, um, uh, to, uh, to request that we, uh, we waive uh, calling because I think the urgency of making sure that we've got all of this work done in time for this key conference in March. And I think for me, you know, this is a classic kind of invest to earn project. If we can put this short term investment in and then get a, a big international investor developer uh, to take interest in world, then that will pay off. Um, I'm, I'm confident in terms of um, you know, uh, jobs and substantial investment going forward. I think if we don't do this, this, this work, we'll miss a huge opportunity that this conference uh, presents us with. So in a nutshell, uh, Cabot, those, those are the recommendations that, are, that I'm proposing in this report on page three. Um, and uh, I do, um, obviously we'll, we'll, we will have a kind of report back on this, but I do think it's, it's important that we do um, invest in, in this initiative. So those are the recommendations. Can we agree? I agree those recommendations. They agree. Okay. Thank you very much. They agreed. So we now come to item six, uh, which is uh, another important report: um, integration of health and care transformation program update. So I'm going to ask Chris Jones, as our cabinet member, to introduce this, and I'm going to bring Anne McLaughlin in uh, as the cabinet member for transformation, because this is.
services together. So whilst we've got a really compelling um, you know, financial position to, in terms of our, our formal budget in the council here, we've, we've also got to ensure that we are we're getting those services right and uh, properly coordinated in the longer term. So um, as, as Chris has said, the key recommendation here today is that uh, we get the staff consultation underway, the formal con consultation to meet the April timetable for the delivery of this project. And of course the governance and the final terms uh, of the uh, agreement with the Community Foundation Trust will be brought back to another cabinet meeting shortly.